Chapter 2 Robes My ordination took place on July 11, 1937, at 4.19 p.m. The ceremony was held inside the ordination hall at Chanthana Rama Monastery, which was located on the banks of the Chantaburi River, not far from Saingam Forest Monastery, where I lived. Chanthana Rama Monastery was the administrative headquarters of the Dhamma Yut Monastic Order for the provinces of Chantaburi, Ranong, and Trat, and was the designated ordination center for the whole area. In those days, a stand of large sandalwood trees, from which the monastery got its name, grew beside the well on the monastery grounds. Presiding over my ordination was my preceptor, Venerable Ajahn Sian Utamo, the monastery's abbot. The Venerable Ajahn Chui Tong Kamdi was my chanting instructor, and the Venerable Ajahn Li Damadaro was my teaching instructor. I was given the Pali name Chundo. I was one month and five days into my twenty-second year, and I was the first person for whom Ajahn Li Damadaro chanted a part in a monk's ordination ceremony. I still remember Ajahn Li's instructions to me on that occasion. You are a meditation monk. The primary work of a meditation monk has been assigned to you today at your ordination. It is given simply as five meditation objects to be memorized and reflected on in forward and reverse order. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and the skin that enwraps the body. It is up to you to contemplate the significance of these physical features in your meditation to the best of your ability. This reflection underlies the true work of those monks who practice according to the principles of Dhamma that were taught by the Lord Buddha. These five body parts are to be contemplated at length until you become aware that the body's true nature is neither inherently beautiful nor desirable, but instead that it is fundamentally unappealing, changeable, unsatisfactory, and thus should not be seen as belonging to you. These five parts form the external, visible features of the human body, the appearance of which can arouse lust and attachment in the mind. Only when the body is properly dissected and analyzed does the mind gradually develop a strong sense of dispassion toward the human form, causing the desires associated with it to begin to weaken and dissolve away. The mind is then free to devote itself to subtler aspects of meditation in search of more lasting and worthwhile forms of happiness. Following the ceremony at Chantana Rama Monastery, I returned with Ajahn Li and Ajahn Gong Ma to Saingam Forest Monastery, where from 1937 to 1939 I spent my first three rains retreats as their student. Those two Ajahns had been Dhamma friends for many years. Before they first met, Ajahn Li had already ordained as a monk at the temple in his home village. When he heard that a wandering Dutanga monk was camping out in the local cemetery, he went to pay his respects and ask him some questions. Ajahn Li was inspired by the Dutanga monk's demeanor, which was so different from the other monks he knew. Ajahn Li asked the monk who his teacher was. He replied that his teacher was Ajahn Mon Buridato, who at that time was staying not far away at Burapa Monastery in the city of Ubon Rachatani. Ajahn Li then traveled several days on foot to reach Burapa Monastery, where he met Ajahn Mon for the first time. He formally paid respects to Ajahn Mon and asked for his guidance. The advice that he received showed him the way forward in his meditation practice. It was there at Burapa Monastery that Ajahn Li made the acquaintance of Ajahn Gong Ma, who was already an accomplished student of Ajahn Mon. Eventually, Ajahn Li convinced Ajahn Gong Ma to take him wandering in the regional forests to search for secluded places to meditate. During their travels, Ajahn Gong Ma's teachings on the Dhamma at various levels impressed Ajahn Li, especially when Ajahn Gong Ma spoke about the results he achieved during the years he practiced under Ajahn Mon's guidance. He explained the body contemplation methods that Ajahn Mon taught and the profound results he gained from their practice, 
which inspired Ajahn Lee to increase his diligence in meditation. The two friends eventually returned to Ajahn Mond, where Ajahn Lee made the decision to take a second ordination with the Dhamma Yut monastic order, the order to which Ajahn Mond belonged. Ajahn Mond arranged for the ordination to take place at Burapa Monastery on May 27, 1927. After following Ajahn Mond for many years, and later wandering Dutanga alone through numerous Thai provinces, Ajahn Lee departed the country's northeast region. He walked around the eastern foothills of the Sankam Beng mountain range that separates the northeast from the southeast region of Thailand, and proceeding south, he walked through the forested slopes of Soi Dao Mountain and entered the southeastern province of Chantaburi for the first time in early 1935. Ajahn Lee settled in Chantaburi province, where he began to teach Dhamma to the lay community. Many of the local inhabitants were so enthusiastic about his Dhamma talks that they arranged a place nearby for him to spend that year's rains retreat. His residence soon became known as Klong Gung Forest Monastery. As meditation gained popularity with increasing numbers of people in Chantaburi, Ajahn Lee's teaching burden increased since he was the only meditation monk available in the area to guide them. This situation prompted Ajahn Lee to write Ajahn Gongma, asking if he could join him and assist him in teaching the laity. After receiving approval from his teacher, Ajahn Singh, Ajahn Gong Ma traveled to Chantaburi and started giving the locals instructions in the virtues of kindness and generosity, proper moral behavior, and meditation. When Ajahn Gong Ma first arrived, Ajahn Li escorted him to Nayai Am village at the request of the district head who wanted to set up a forest monastery there. Nayai Am village was a very poor community with the reputation of being a rural hideout where bandits took shelter from the authorities. Finding a quiet spot conducive to meditation, Ajahn Gong Ma camped in the forest outside the village for many months, allowing the locals a chance to get better acquainted with him. He taught them lessons in moral conduct to inspire them to feel remorseful about their past misdeeds and instill in them a healthy fear of the consequences of immoral behavior. To this end, he stressed the importance of strict adherence to the five precepts, which represent the foundation of all virtuous actions. By listening to his teachings and putting his advice into practice, the villagers' lives began to improve. As their hearts learned to accept Ajahn Gong Ma's practical instructions, their faith in him increased. With a belief in the benefits of moral virtue instilled in the hearts of its residents, the village that was once a hotbed of lawlessness became a cool, pleasant place to live. Old animosities died away to be replaced by a reverence for the monk whose teachings had made such an impression. When Ajahn Gong Ma eventually left Na Yai Am village, the people there cried like small children mourning the loss of a parent. Due to Ajahn Lee's influence in the province, forest monks were sought after in village communities around Chantaburi. My hometown, Nong Bua, was one such village. Its residents, who harbored a strong faith in the Buddha and his teachings, had on multiple occasions invited Ajahn Lee to settle in their vicinity and guide them in matters of virtuous conduct and meditation. Ajahn Lee was unable to oblige their request, but they were nonetheless eager to support another monk from the forest tradition. At that time, a group of the town's devout lay supporters heard that Ajahn Gong Ma, who had the reputation of being a strict practitioner, was staying with Ajahn Lee at Klong Gung Forest Monastery. Six people from the group volunteered to travel to Ajahn Lee's monastery and invite Ajahn Gong Ma to return with them to Nong Bua. They did not propose to invite Ajahn Gong Ma simply to have him perform religious rituals. These people were truly interested in Dhamma and possessed a thorough knowledge of the Buddhist scriptures. They also valued the wise counsel of practicing forest monks. After a two-hour boat ride, the petitioners landed at the dock in Chantaburi and walked the rest of the way to the monastery. So delighted was the group when they first met Ajahn Gong Ma that they immediately proffered him their invitation. Ajahn Gong Ma responded by saying, 
you should go back home and make a solemn wish, asking the triple gem to provide an auspicious omen. If an auspicious omen appears, you can return. Otherwise, don't come back. Immediately, one of the villagers spoke up. Venerable sir, I've received a good omen already. Last night I dreamt that two beautiful white elephants, a mother and her baby, approached me. But when I reached out my hand to pet them, the pair of them turned into a white chicken. Ajahn Gongma listened quietly to the man's story and contemplated the meaning of the dream for a while. He then said, Well, in that case I agree to move to Nongbua village. Come back to pick me up on Wednesday, March 17th. The year was 1936. Let's reflect for a moment on the story of the villager's dream, the one in which two white elephants turned into a white chicken as soon as he started petting them. Dreams like that tend to be dismissed as fanciful imaginings. But to the surprise of all the monks, novices, and villagers of Nongbua, the white chicken dream turned out to have a real-life basis. About a mile from the burial ground lived a farmer that everyone called Uncle Bay, who raised chickens for a living. His prized chicken was a plump white one. The very same night that Ajahn Gong Ma arrived at the burial ground, Uncle Bay decided to catch and kill that white chicken. His intention was to make a spicy lemongrass curry with it, which he planned to offer to the monks the next morning. In the dead of night, Uncle Bay chased the white chicken around the coop in a fruitless effort to capture it. The coop's high walls made the job impossible as the chicken easily flew up to evade his grasp. In the end, worn out and weary of the chase, Uncle Bay decided to go to bed and try again, first thing the next morning. He reckoned that daylight gave him a better chance of killing the chicken. Before dawn the next day, however, the white chicken had already awakened and eaten its food before the other chickens woke up. Then it started crowing loudly in an agitated manner, as though it was giving vent to a feeling of anger and resentment. No matter how well that man raised and fed me, in the end he aims to kill me for food like he slaughtered the pigs next door. Thinking like this, the white chicken began to panic. It frantically paced the coop before daybreak on the lookout for danger. Just the night before, it had managed to escape certain death. Today, it might not be so fortunate. Having considered its options, the chicken began scratching the ground looking for food to bolster its strength for the coming struggle. At the same time, it reflected on how it could escape from the coop. As the morning sun rose over the horizon and the dim light of dawn began to illuminate its surroundings, the white chicken knew there wasn't much time left. Once the sun's rays struck its feathers, the white chicken gave out a big crow and jumped high into the air, launching its body out of the coop and onto the branch of an overhanging tree. Flying from branch to branch and crowing as loud as it could, it proceeded across the fields toward the burial ground where Ajahn Gong Ma stayed. Almost immediately, Uncle Bay ran after it in hot pursuit. Staying just ahead of him, the chicken made its way into the grounds of Ajahn Gong Ma's new monastery. Uncle Bay chased it around the grounds, making grabs at it while trying to drive it off monastery property. He managed to chase the white chicken back to his house three times, but it still evaded his grasp. Each time the bird bolted back to the monastery. The third time, feeling its very life to be at stake, the white chicken headed straight for Ajahn Gong Ma's newly built hut, landed right on the roof, and refused to move. Fearful of Ajahn Gong Ma, Uncle Bay didn't dare approach any closer. Feeling safe at last, the white chicken made its home in the monastery, taking Ajahn Gong Ma as its guardian. As its story spread through the village community, the white chicken soon became a kind of local celebrity, all of which led to the village man's dream coming alive in the folklore of Saingam Forest Monastery. The chicken remained a fixture at a John Gongma's residence, leaving it only to follow him around. The white chicken searched for food at his hut and roosted in a tree nearby. On occasions when Ajahn Gong Ma moved to another hut for a night, the faithful chicken followed along with him. 
Whichever hut he moved to, on whichever day, it traveled behind him like a shadow. In the end, it followed Ajahn Gong Ma everywhere. Ajahn Gong Ma could train the chicken to do almost anything. When he told it to roost in a certain tree, it obeyed his command. When he told it to go somewhere, it took off straight away. When he ordered it to stop, it stood stock still. It was as though it understood Ajahn Gong Ma's spoken commands. He always treated it with fondness and a gentle kindness. Whenever Ajahn Gong Ma was reading a book on monastic discipline, the white chicken would walk up close and stand right next to the book. It remained right beside the book, obscuring Ajahn Gong Ma's view of the pages. Almost as though it was jealous of the attention he paid to the book. It even glared and cast angry glances at whatever Vinaya text Ajahn Gong Ma was holding, which made for a strange sight. The white chicken became a major attraction for visitors to the monastery. Soon they started playing with it and teasing it just for fun. Over time, the chicken became frustrated and annoyed by all the unwanted attention. The playfulness of their intentions aside, people just wouldn't leave the poor creature alone. Eventually, it couldn't abide the constant intrusions any longer and began to strike out at its tormentors by kicking at anyone who teased it. Before long, everyone got the message. Whoever disturbs the white chicken gets kicked. But its kick could be dangerous, especially to toddlers and small children, because the chicken had long, menacing spurs on its feet, capable of causing injury. No one dared to discipline the chicken, however, because it was viewed as being Ajahn Gong Ma's favorite. When the situation reached a crisis, the laymen and women who frequented the monastery decided to take matters into their own hands. Together, they decided to cut off the spurs on the chicken's feet in order to keep everyone safe. Concluding that they could no longer allow it to injure people, they caught it one day and chopped off the menacing spurs with a machete. The chicken was extremely upset and angered by this brutal attack. It felt that its source of strength and courage to resist its tormentors had been hacked off. Venting its anger, it ran constantly around the monastery, screeching from morning till night. Distraught and inconsolable, the chicken fled at the sight of people, rebuffing all playful gestures. It no longer trusted people. Yet those same people continued to disturb its peace and quiet at every opportunity. In the end, it tried to avoid contact with people altogether. It wanted to live alone without fear of disturbance. Its body and mind could relax only when it was perched high up in the branches of a tall tree. But no matter where it went to hide, people searched until they found its hiding place. At last, heartbroken, it decided to return to Uncle Bay. One day it walked home, crestfallen, with its head hanging low to the ground, and never returned. The incident with the white chicken caused a lot of Ajahn Gong Ma's lay supporters to change their attitude towards animals. Some of them gave up killing animals for the rest of their lives. Some made steadfast resolutions to uphold the moral precepts till their dying day. Some felt guilty and came to regret the things they had done to the white chicken. The whole episode was incredible. It was like a dream that comes true. A local man dreamed that he had two white elephants, a mother and her infant, which represented Ajahn Gong Ma and the novice monk. Upon petting them, the elephants turned into a white chicken. Shortly afterward, a white chicken shows up at Ajahn Gong Ma's new monastery. This occurrence made a lasting impression on the local people, which caused them to reflect on its deeper significance. Might it be possible that a person of great merit and accomplishment will come to Saingam Forest Monastery, someone who ordains as a monk and attains the highest level of Dhamma, becoming pure and unsullied like the white chicken's feathers? Similar to the fearless white chicken, this person will be brave and determined in the practice of Dhamma. The white chicken must be an auspicious sign, one that portends the appearance of a powerful white elephant in the realm of the Buddha's teachings. 
As word of these events spread, the residents of Nongbua village began to believe that the white chicken story was a good omen, indicating that Ajahn Gongma would attract outstanding disciples to ordain with him at Saingam Forest Monastery. But oddly enough, even though I lived right there in Nongbua during the period of this incident, I knew nothing about it. I was obviously too busy having fun in my youth to take any notice. On the other hand, of all the many monks who ordained with Ajahn Gong Ma at Saingam Forest Monastery, I was the very first. Therefore, the story of the white elephants becoming the white chicken was particularly relevant to me. Although, I'm probably not the chicken. I was still quite young when I entered the monkhood. I started my first rains retreat lazy, loud, and difficult to teach. Mainly, I avoided others and slept whenever I had a chance. By the middle of the rains retreat, I began to realize that it was inappropriate to be so stubborn and lazy. Feeling ashamed, I took to scolding myself. Where did this idleness come from? Every day I eat the food that the villagers offer to monks out of faith in us. And yet how do I repay them? By being lazy? I don't deserve their faith and respect. Before leaving lay life to become a monk, I worked very hard. I rode my boat non-stop day and night. Now that I'm a monk, why am I suddenly a no-good lazy bastard? I'm really no different from the good-for-nothing idiot who's too lazy to work to earn a living. I don't deserve people's respect. And yet the faithful pay their respects to me and offer me food because they think that I am a virtuous monk. In the end, I cursed myself. You bastard! What kind of a monk are you? How dare you let people bow down to you when you can't even meditate as well as some of the elderly folks in town? Why did you bother to become a monk anyway? After berating myself for being useless, I was fired up and ready to do battle and overcome my shortcomings. Searching for a means to fight against the ignoble side of my character that made me lazy, weak, and worthless. I sat down to meditate repeating the meditation word Budo with the same serious-minded purpose that I'd always done things before laziness took hold of me. I thought, before I ordained, I said that I would never back down from anyone. But now, I back down from my own weaknesses so easily that I've become their obedient slave. Is this feebleness something to be proud of? Hell no. Okay, that does it, I thought. I won't give in, even if it means death. From now on, I will take the Buddha as my example and practice with an earnestness similar to his. I vow to adopt the same diligence in my meditation practice that the Buddha's Arahant disciples did in theirs. From now on, I will refuse to back down when confronted by my internal enemies. From the moment I took up Buddha meditation in earnest, my attitude toward the monastic way of living totally changed. Whether I was seated in meditation or pacing back and forth on my meditation path, the effort I exerted was forceful and unrelenting. Ajahn Gong Ma taught me to practice walking meditation by pacing back and forth along a straight line between two well-marked points, located 30 to 40 paces apart, and laid out at a quiet and secluded location in the forest. His instructions were to stand erect and alert, with hands joined just below the waist, the palm of the right hand overlapping and clasping the back of the left. While walking, the eyes should be kept focused on the ground a few paces ahead. I was told to walk diligently back and forth along the path, pivoting at each end and then returning. Because the repetition of Budo gave good results, I harmonized that mental repetition with the pace of walking, each footfall being coordinated with bood and then do. In this way, I practiced walking meditation every day and every night without fail until my worldly infatuations and ambitions started to fade away. As the burden on my heart grew lighter, my mind felt calmer. Sometimes I became so absorbed in meditation that I walked three or four hours at a stretch without a break, oblivious to the time of day or changes in the weather. By the end of my first rains retreat, I had spent so many hours doing walking meditation that the earthen path I walked on started breaking apart from continuous use. Whoever claims that the development of virtuous, mental qualities 
does not demand the sacrifice of every ounce of energy for the sake of the highest good, that person doesn't know what he's talking about. How can sacrificing your life for the sake of moral excellence not entail expending valued time and energy? Far from what people might think, development in Dhamma requires giving the endeavor everything you've got. Until nothing's held back, and no more energy remains to throw into the effort. As the momentum of my meditation gathered pace, I sought fresh contemplations to stimulate my mindfulness. For instance, I began reflecting on death. Can people who are wealthy and have many material possessions take any of that stuff with them when they die? No. Regardless of what efforts a person has made to be successful in life, all their possessions and their worldly achievements are lost at the time of death. All things appear and disappear. They never last. When monks are invited to officiate at a funeral ceremony, they perform the ritual of taking robe-making cloth from the coffin of the deceased. This funeral rite is performed not because the cloth itself has special value, but rather as an opportunity for the monks and relatives of the deceased to solemnly reflect on the nature of death, on the truth that one day all of them will certainly die as well. As the monks take the cloth, they chant, Anicca Vata Sankara. All compounded things, including our bodies and minds, are impermanent and subject to change. Nothing carries on in the same way forever. Unfortunately, most people never stop to reflect on their own bodies and minds. They are too lost in trivial thoughts to see their life frittering away, slipping away from them moment by moment as they settle into habitual ruts of thought and behavior. To get out of those ruts, they must learn to focus on the present moment. For this very purpose, I encourage people to focus their minds on Budo for as long as they can, for days at a time, for months or even years, until it becomes a habit that remains with them all the time. By then, their meditation should be unshakable. If the mind resists their efforts to calm down while walking and repeating Budo, I advise them to remain steadfast and persistent. Continue walking in step with Budo until the restless mind relents and becomes peaceful, even if that means pacing back and forth for hours. As the mind becomes absorbed in Budo, concentration deepens, and the rhythm and pace of walking adapt to the steady stream of awareness that has developed. Then, the whole body may appear to float effortlessly along the path as though riding on a cushion of air. I often experienced that feeling of floating while I walked meditation. It felt as though body and mind were suspended above the ground, at one moment soaring up and away, at another gliding back down, then up again. I could walk like that for hours, oblivious to the time and the fact that I was sweating profusely throughout. Walking meditation was such an enjoyable experience that I became hooked on the pleasant feeling and didn't want to stop. Which just goes to show how rewarding walking meditation can be when you put your all into the practice. In the early days of my monastic life, however, my meditation practice lacked proper direction and consistency. On some occasions the results were encouraging, on others I felt drowsy and couldn't stay awake on the meditation seat. My half-hearted effort was discouraging. Deep down, I felt ashamed of myself for being so lazy in meditation. I compared my attitude to that of the monastery's lay supporters who found time to practice meditation even though they worked long hours and had busy family lives. And there I was, a fully ordained monk, a son of the Buddha, sitting around idly from dawn to dusk, gazing at the Buddha statue with droopy eyes, attending to my teacher with a lazy indifference, and sleepwalking through my duties at the meditation hall. Instead of trying harder to be more diligent than ordinary village folk, I was no match for them. I also thought to myself that I am a human being, just like the Buddha and his Arahant disciples. I live the same way they did and eat the same kinds of food. How come they were able to attain such exalted spiritual heights while I'm stuck in a rut? 
Obviously, I have only myself to blame. Is laziness a virtue? Of course not. The wise people of this world always praise hard-working individuals. Why do I feel so sluggish and drowsy? Don't I feel embarrassed seeing the monastery's main hall full of lay people sitting attentively in meditation? I have worked hard all my life. I was able to accomplish things that no one else could. How come, now that I'm a monk, I can't learn to meditate wakefully? Why can't I figure this out? Considering my predicament in that way made me feel deeply dismayed. Making up my mind then and there to dramatically change course, I rose from my seat, approached the Buddha statue on my knees, and bowed to the Lord Buddha three times. With my hands joined together and my mind intensely focused, I made a solemn resolve. From this moment on, if I do not meditate with unbending resolve, may I be destroyed by lightning bolts, earthquakes, floods, and raging fires. After putting my life on the line by making that uncompromising vow, my heart felt a burst of energy as my mind steeled for the challenge. Courage welled up inside as I prepared to face a life-or-death moment. I fervently appealed to the power inherent in the good karma I'd accumulated from past virtuous actions to help me succeed in freeing my mind from all encumbering hindrances. To realize my vow, I began meditating day and night, sitting for long stretches during the day and walking for hours on end after dark. From the moment I made that resolve, I forced my mind to stay firmly on the repetition of Budo. I had come to the conclusion that, for me, Focusing on Buddha was preferable to focusing on the breath as an object of meditation because my mind drifted too easily between the in and out breaths. From the time I awoke in the morning until I fell asleep at night, I made my mind think only Buddha. Thus, Buddha became my sole preoccupation. All other concerns were irrelevant. Maintaining such a single minded focus was a struggle. I had to force my mind to be with Budo each and every moment without interruption. When my attention began to slip, I quickened the pace of the repetition, Budo, 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 faster and faster, leaving no opening for other thoughts to gain a foothold. At times I hammered away like that for many hours without moving, but my mind still refused to reach a calm and concentrated state. I then cursed myself, you bastard. When there's fish, you eat fish. When there's shrimp, you eat shrimp. When there's duck, you eat duck, too. Chili sauces and curries and syrups and sugars, you get to eat them all. So why the hell won't you work for me? Whether I was seated in meditation, doing walking meditation, or performing daily chores, the word budo resonated deeply within my mind at all times. As I've mentioned, by temperament I was always bold and uncompromising and this tenacity worked to my advantage. In the end, I became so earnestly committed to the meditation that nothing could shake my resolve. No errant thought could separate the mind from Budo. As it happened, that was the only way I could quiet my mind and attain samadhi. Having staked my life on the solemn pledge I took, I could not let up or give in. Even when I sat in meditation continuously for five hours but still couldn't bring the mind to stillness, I did not dare to get up and take a break for fear of suffering the consequences of breaking my vow. I just had to force myself to submit to those harsh training methods. Aw, oh, my legs hurt. Ow, I can't fight anymore. Aw, oh, I'm getting up in another half an hour. I'm done. This is awful. I needed to battle that internal discord. A warrior must fight. There is no other way to achieve victory. Practicing meditation earnestly to attain deep calm and concentration means being totally committed to the work at each stage of the practice. Nothing less than total commitment will succeed. To experience deep levels of samadhi, meditators cannot afford to be half-hearted and listless, forever wavering because they lack a firm resolve to guide their practice. Meditators without a solid commitment to the principles of practice can meditate their entire lives without gaining satisfactory results. When, with supreme effort, my mind was able to let go of everything and drop into samadhi, 
the experience was an indescribably amazing, silent, and smooth stillness of mind. That stillness was accompanied by an incredible feeling of lightness and buoyancy that made my body feel as though it was hovering in midair. I was conscious of a similar sense of floating when walking on the meditation path as though I was flying above the path. My meditation soon reached a point where I could walk all night without sleeping. Eventually, the meditation path became so worn down and broken apart that the monks would look at it in disbelief. They couldn't understand how two feet could exact so much punishment on the sandy soil beneath them. But how could it be otherwise when I continued to walk night after night without stopping to rest? Resolutely safeguarding my vow involved exerting myself to the limit of my endurance and then pushing beyond it. My determination was so strong that nothing would deter me. If eating became an obstacle to fulfilling my vow, then I just wouldn't eat. If keeping the vow meant death, I was prepared to die. I would not back down. When, with all my determined effort, the mind still refused to converge into samadhi, I'd counter with an even more potent vow and increase my exertions. This boldness became so much a part of my practice that Ajahn Lee began warning people, Don't dare challenge Tan Jia. He won't give in to anyone, not even the devas. He'll accept anyone's challenge. During the hot season months of my first year in robes, I joined three fellow monks hiking through the mountainous region in the northern part of Shantaburi province, seeking out quiet and secluded forested locations where we could practice meditation undisturbed. That region had tracts of forest and hilly terrain that were well suited to our need for solitude. In the style of Dutanga monks, we wandered from place to place, hiking through forests and mountains in locales where there were just enough small village settlements to support our daily alms round. We each carried an umbrella tent slung over one shoulder and an alms bowl slung over the other. When we found a quiet spot that was conducive to meditation, we camped for a while in the outlying forests near those small settlements. We saw this lifestyle as a way to be serious in our determination to practice correctly for the sake of Dhamma. We became convinced that working tirelessly to improve our meditation practice was the most important task in monastic life. The four of us returned safely to Saingam Forest Monastery shortly before the start of the 1938 Rains Retreat. In our enthusiasm for the ascetic way of life, we decided to use that rains retreat to strictly observe some of the Dutanga practices that the Buddha recommended. We wanted to emulate genuine practicing monks who were striving earnestly for liberation from suffering. Together, we pledged to walk to the village for alms round every morning, except when fasting, to sweep the monastery grounds and clean the main hall every morning and evening without fail, to eat food only from our alms bowls, and as a group, to pay our respects by bowing to the Buddha and to our teachers every morning. Other practices that were mandatory for the rainy season retreat included gathering at 8 p.m. for evening chanting, followed by a Vinaya reading and a group meditation session that lasted until 11 p.m. We were required to wake up at 3 a.m. and meditate on our own until 5 a.m., and then gather at the main hall for the morning alms round. By far, the most challenging practice that a few of us undertook was going without sleep the whole night until dawn. Of all of us, I was the most committed to this practice, as I made a solemn vow from the very beginning not to sleep at night throughout the entire three months of the retreat period. Following the potency of my previous vow, I bowed deeply to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, steadied my mind and focused it inward, repeating silently to myself, I vow through the power of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha not to sleep during the hours from dusk to dawn every day for the entire three months of this rain's retreat. Should I break this vow for any reason, may I be destroyed by lightning bolts, earthquakes, floods, and raging fires. Upholding the integrity of my vow was the most important aspect of its success, 
because that indicated how well the potency of my past comma had prepared me for the intense challenge ahead. Karmic strengths and weaknesses are crucial factors in meditation, because the moral quality of our past actions largely determines the strength and depth of our meditation and reinforces our readiness to persevere through hardships and difficulties without giving in. In that way, our capacity to carry out a vow relies on an accumulation of inner worth, which is based on the good merit we have made. The cultivation of inner worth is an important aspect of how effectively we can overcome the obstacles we face in intensive practice. Being able to stick with a demanding challenge indicates a high level of virtuous comma, a degree of excellence which those who fail the challenge tend to lack. In truth, it's not easy to succeed. Most people fail. It's easy to make a solemn vow, but extremely difficult to put your life on the line to realize it. I admit I wasn't mentally prepared for how difficult it would be to forego sleep every night. My whole life I had routinely laid down to sleep at that time. When suddenly I had to stop and stay awake, instead, my body struggled to adapt. Some nights I wanted to collapse on the floor and pass out. But by repeating Budo with unrelenting determination, I managed to enter samadhi and go long periods without sleep. As I pushed myself past the bounds of physical endurance with a complete lack of regard for my health, the thin flesh on my buttocks became bruised and sore, making it extremely painful to sit long hours. But I had the strength of a bull in those days and a temperament to match. Consequently, I devoted the entire Rains retreat to meditation without spending a single moment lying down to recuperate. Despite the pain and difficulty I endured, never once, day or night, did I lie down to rest. I hardly slept at all, either. I took short naps in the daytime, sitting up and leaning my back against a post, but only to give me enough rest to stay awake all night. I always felt drowsy in the morning when walking on alms round. But I doggedly resisted the fatigue and pushed on fearing the consequences should I fail to escape from the world of sangsara and fall again into human existence with its suffering, constant change, and certainty of death and rebirth. During my three-month-long quest to abstain from sleep, I experienced nights when the conditions in my meditation were just right, moments when my mind was centered and so totally focused on Budo that I became oblivious to the time of day and the external environment. No images or visions appeared in the mind at all. When the mind was free of distraction and fully concentrated, a refined awareness was all that remained, standing out prominently on its own. Occasionally, feelings of body and mind ceased altogether, leaving an incomparable stillness in their place. Aside from occasionally experiencing such sublime states, maintaining my vow day in and day out was usually a struggle. There were times when I just wanted to escape, but each time I doubled down on my primary purpose. Any thought of surrender was out of the question, because surrender meant reneging on my solemn pledge, the dishonor of which might shame me into abandoning my life as a monk. To inspire courage, I reflected on the fate of worldly folk who are drowning in the vast and deep ocean of Sangsara. Life has no purpose in its depths, other than to be food for turtles and fish to prey upon. Dying such a death is worse than useless. And yet living beings continue to sink through those dark waters with no prospect of salvation. Unless a liberating vessel comes to their rescue, they will die a meaningless death at the bottom of the sea. I was determined not to follow suit. Contrary to popular sentiment, living the life of a householder, having a spouse and supporting children, struggling for financial prosperity and trying desperately to hold on to it, entails many causes for disappointment and dissatisfaction. Because of the pressure they feel to earn a living and raise a family, people run frantically around day and night with little time to rest their minds and experience peace. The Buddha was right when he declared, the fetter that shackles people to a life of pain and suffering is the fetter of attachment to sons and daughters, husbands and wives, property and possessions. 
These personal bonds are the most difficult to disengage from and go beyond. Grasping at and clinging to them drags people down to the deepest point in the sea of perpetual life and death, where they languish in the darkness, unable to find their way up to the light at the surface. People everywhere value worldly knowledge more than the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. The Buddha was right when he declared, the fetter that shackles people to a life of pain and suffering is the fetter of attachment to sons and daughters, husbands and wives, property and possessions. These personal bonds are the most difficult to disengage from and go beyond. Grasping at and clinging to them drags people down to the deepest point in the sea of perpetual life and death, where they languish in the darkness, unable to find their way up to the light at the surface. People everywhere value worldly knowledge more than the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. The Buddha was very clear when he declared, I cannot see any fetter more dangerous than craving for binding living beings to an existence of endless wandering in Sangsara, the realm of pain and suffering. But most people are reluctant to take the words of the Buddha to heart and act upon them. They'd rather waste their time gossiping, taking it easy, and having fun. When they come to visit the monastery, they bring radios and other devices that they listen to furtively while the monks are teaching Dhamma. Even though the real purpose of visiting a monastery should be to leave all worldly pleasures and amusements at home and focus wholeheartedly on learning the way to find true and lasting happiness in their lives.